In today's video, we are determining if our diaphragm is truly flexible or if it's rigid based on uh, code mandates per the ASCE 716. And we're doing the equations. We're doing them by hand, obviously. I learned something new myself. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Smash that like button if you want. You really don't have to. Why does it always gotta be over the top? Like, hey, like the video if you'd like. And if you're learning something new and you kinda like the vibe I got going on here and you wanna see more of it, subscribe. But you don't have to, but it's totally free and it helps out the channel a ton. Anywho, it's totally up to you. All right, well, what determines whether you're a flexible diaphragm or a rigid diaphragm? Well, that's the ASCE 716. So for example, a building with a wood roof that has uh, reinforced concrete shear walls or masonry shear walls can be classified as a flexible system. The shear walls are significantly more stiff than the wood roof, but the lines get blurry a little bit when you analyze a structure that is say, uh, has a wood roof, but also has wood shear walls. This is because it depends on the relative deformation of the shear walls and the diaphragm. And per the 716, this is when the midpoint displacement of the diaphragm exceeds two times the average story drift. This is illustrated down below here. I wanted to take this snip. You can find it in the code as well um, to help kind of digest what I just said. And then from there, once you have a flexible diaphragm determined, you can run calculations and assume that your diaphragm is like a simple, uh, simply supported beam between shear walls and you can run your calculations based on a tributary width uh, between shear walls to determine what load gets transferred to what shear walls. And lastly, wood diaphragms usually consist of wood sheathing or uh, bare metal deck. And now take that definition and flip it uh, to the opposite when you are defining a diaphragm as rigid. So a diaphragm is rigid when the midpoint displacement of that diaphragm does not exceed two times the average story drift. And this ultimately means that your diaphragm experiences rigid, rigid body rotation, if I can talk, uh, and then the distribution of lateral loading to your vertical lateral elements depends on their relative stiffness. The stiffer your shear wall, uh, the more load that's gonna be concentrated towards that. Rigid diaphragms usually consist of reinforced concrete slabs, PT slabs, uh, concrete on metal deck, and slab on metal deck. Um, maybe there's some others in there, but ultimately think about it like the more thick and beefy and rigid your diaphragm, the more likely it is that it's going to be a rigid diaphragm. Although again, it's not just dependent on the properties of the diaphragm, it's dependent on the relationship of the diaphragm and its uh, vertical lateral elements, shear walls, brace frames, anything in between. All right, I think we have enough background to knock out a design example um, and actually put some numbers to the theory. Now that we've clearly defined the definitions of a flexible diaphragm and a rigid diaphragm, we're now going to tackle this problem and determine it for our tilt-up structure. If we scroll back up just a little bit, you'll see in our previous problem, we found the midpoint displacement of our wood diaphragm which was 45.6 inches. But now we need to find the average story drift in order to compare that to determine uh, whether our diaphragm is flexible or rigid. I'm gonna be saying from the previous example a lot, so if you're confused or you're hazy as to where I'm pulling these numbers from, just pause the video real quick, open up a new thumbnail and go uh, check out my previous videos on that and we get all into the nooks and crannies and all of your questions are hopefully answered. If not, always leave a comment below. V ultimate along this shear wall, so we're gonna be looking in blue at this shear wall right here was equal to 88 kips. And that's because we need to get to strength level forces when we're determining our deflections and our story drift. And this is the demand from just the mass contribution from the out of plane portions of walls and the actual roof framing itself. But now we're looking at in plane shear for uh, the shear wall line above in blue and now we need to take that additional mass of the shear wall itself into the equation. So we're gonna have to grab a little bit of more additional mass and then convert that into additional demand for our calculations below. So that's what I'm gonna do next here. So WT for the shear wall is equal to 120 feet times 24.5 feet. This is the total length of shear wall. This is the total height of the shear wall times the thickness of the wall, which was six inches. And then the unit weight of concrete, which is 0 0.15 kips per cubic foot, 120 or 150 uh, P 
PCF, I've converted that into KIPP. So that's all that's happening there. Don't panic. That comes out to 220.5 additional KIPPs of seismic mass. And from previous, our C sub S is equal to 0 0.165, which means that our additional V ult of the, I'll go in parentheses, wall itself is equal to 220.5 kips times 0 0.165, which gets us 36.4 kips of additional demand. And so what's happening here is we have our uh, V ultimate from the diaphragm. So I've now redefined it as V uh, dia. Um, that was what we saw for above of 88 kips. So I'm just gonna do 88 right here. And then we just solved for V wall, which is 36.4 kips, which is acting at the midpoint of the wall. Now you can sum all that together like I have in just a point load. And since this is a basically a cantilevered condition, I mean, it's not basically, it is a cantilevered condition, you can do it two different ways. You can sum up that, that demand and put it at mid height of the wall, as long as the wall is uniform geometry and all that kind of stuff and all the mass is uniform. Uh, and because basically you can just compare the summation of the moments about the base of the wall. So this M right here, get my, hopefully my big fat head out of the way. So for this condition, M would be equal to V wall times, um, we said that this is H times H over two, or you could do instead of the summed up point load, you could do an evenly distributed demand along the full height of the wall. And you get that number literally by just taking this and dividing it by H, which would get you that number. And then you get that M, again, hopefully my head's not in the way, equal to, uh, if we call that evenly distributed load X, it would be X times H squared over two, which is the same thing. So um, either way you can, you can put that additional demand however you'd like. I usually like to keep it as a point load because it just makes the equations more simple, but it is ultimately up to you as long as you are consistent. And that was just quick math. So hopefully I didn't frick up those two little easy equations, um, but let me know below if I did. And in order to determine our drift of our wall, we are gonna actually need to take um, a total demand at the top of our wall um, for our following deflection equations. And you're like, well, we have a point load at the top and we got this point load in the middle of the wall. So like, what do we do? Well, the reason I brought up before the summation of the moments is that you can put that demand anywhere you want on this wall. Again, as long as the geometry of the wall is uniform and the thickness is uniform and the mass is, is uniform across this wall, you can lump it wherever you want as long as that summation of additional moment at the base um, is, and, and shear at the base actually, is, is equal. And so that means we can actually do this little trick where we can move the demand from V wall up to the top of the wall. And by going up top here, all we need to do is actually take V wall demand and divide it by two, because now you're taking your length component, H over two, and you are doubling it because now you're going the full H. So H over two becomes H. And that means your V wall needs to be divided by two because you doubled your height. So V wall now becomes V wall over two. We will now call for the equations moving forward, F. So F is gonna be equal to V dia plus V wall over two. 106.2 kips. Keep that in the back pocket. We're gonna need that moving forward. All right, now that we have our demand, we can now get into our drift equations. Your total drift is gonna be equal to a combination of uh, two drift cases. One induced uh, by bending and the other induced by shear is equal to the following equation. And you're like, well, where did you get that? Well, the first place I intuitively decided to look was my CERM, my Civil Engineering Reference Manual. This is the 15th edition. I know that there's more out there nowadays and I know it's a sore subject because with people studying for the PE exam and it's going computer-based, 
you don't necessarily, well, you don't get to bring it. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have one of these. It's got a lot of great information. And uh, under my strength of materials chapter, I'll try to show you, maybe I'll take a snip, but eh, let's see if you can see it. I have a great little chart right here that is getting totally washed out, but it's got all of your different stiffness equations and def uh, deflection equations based on the different geometries that you have. And one of ours is a cantilevered wall condition, which is exactly what we have. So that's where I got this equation from. And then the other one is uh, deflection due to shear. And that is through the equation, but let's start with the more straightforward one, which is the bending. And you're like, why is that one more straightforward? You're gonna find out. Um, but F is 106.2 kips. H is your height, which is equal to 24.5 feet from the previous examples. That equates to, we're gonna pull it into inches to keep it consistent with our equations, 294 inches. E, Young's modulus, is equal to, for concrete, uh, and you can find this in your ACI, but is equal to 57,000 square root of F prime C. For our problem, we are going to take um, pretty typical concrete as to 4,000 PSI. Uh, and that, once you crunch the numbers, gets you 3605 KSI. So make sure that you plug in PSI underneath the square root symbol. You can't change it to four and then do it. It, it scrambles the equation. So. Um, just watch yourself on that. And I is going to be, if I take like a section looking down, call it section AA, and then I go green, it's going to be that cross section right there looking down in plan. So that green would be the length, eh, sorry, let me go right here. So that I would be the length of your total shear wall, L, and the thickness of the wall would be B. So I for the rectangle is B D cubed over 12. And that spits out 1.49 times 10 to the ninth inches to the fourth. Boy, that, that was a lot there. Some of you might be saying, wait a second, do we need to consider like cracked section or all any kind of that kind of stuff? I'm going to continue assuming a non-cracked section or an uncracked section um, and we are going to come back to that because I, I just want to walk us through this and then kind of point that out at the end. Because from the example problem that I was walking through, they did not take the crack section. They kept the uncracked, which is weird to me. So I'm going to include that at the end as my own kind of twist. And then I'd like it to be an open discussion from all of you to let me know if I'm doing it right. Okay. So. Stay with me here, we're going through the process. So delta M, all plugged in, is equal to the following. 0 0.000167 inches. Man, that thing is moving. Now, this is just um, drift due to bending, or due to, to moment. Um, it's insignificantly small, but then again, we also have 120 feet of uh, specially reinforced concrete shear wall. So, I mean, that's a ton of shear wall and your aspect ratio is great because it's 120 feet in length and it's only 24.5 feet tall. So it's a super ultra stiff wall. So you're not gonna get a lot of drift. So, but let's keep going. Just keep those things in the back of your mind as to kind of give yourself hopefully a little bit of confidence to say, am I going down the right path or is there a red flag? Like if you got a large, you know, drift, then maybe you're like, what the heck's going on? Maybe I missed a variable or a number. Or I didn't convert something right. But I know that looks very, very small, but let's keep going. 